Welcome to a little institution that we've uh, recently developed in our Economy and Society Summer School. And we originally conceived of these as fireside chats or fireside conversations. But um, King Saul has graced us with his presence so we can have a sunside uh, 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 conversation instead. And um, our guest for our conversation today is uh, uh, Professor Tom Moylan from the University of, of Limerick. I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Tom because he's a professor of um, contemporary uh, writing in English. In other words, a professor of English literature, but mind you, contemporary uh, writing in, in literature, which is uh, I interesting in itself. And Tom's uh, particular interest was in the uh, literature on utopia and in science fiction and fictional representations of possible futures, pasts, and so on. And Tom has been, a, I'd say, a leading international figure in uh, such uh, fiction uh, for, for many years now. And he's the founder director of the Rallaheim Center for Utopian Studies at the University of Limerick. Um, Tom is a man who wears many hats and um, covers many genres and fields and so on and he's well known to us in the social sciences and the humanities because of his ability to reach and speak across a whole lot of different uh, fields. I should say that shortly after Tom came to Ireland to take up his professorship we had him as one of our first guests at an early incarnation of this Economy and Society Summer School which was in Allahees in West Cork. We had a uh, uh, a weekend, uh, an annual weekend symposium there in interpretive political sociology, which anticipated maybe other uh, uh, contributions uh, um, in, in subsequent years. But Tom has been a friend of sociology, not just in, in UCC, but uh, throughout the country, uh, political science, um, um, the humanities generally, he's examined theses in all sorts of uh, fields and we found him always interested, always willing, always enthusiastically engaged with whatever the current debates were. Tom is presently uh, teaching in an architecture department, that's one of his many and ongoing interests, uh, as uh, an adjunct professor in, in um, architecture. Uh, he is um, a friend, uh, a close friend I should say, of uh, the patron of this uh, school, uh, President Michael D. Higgins, and uh, Michael D. Higgins was uh, a regular, um, let's say, advocate of the kind of work that Tom was doing at uh, the University of Limerick. Now, when Tom came to the University of Limerick, he didn't, as it were, fall simply out of the sky in some utopian science fictional uh, scenario. He was, in fact, coming home in some sense, because his, uh, his ancestral home was in County Clare, uh, in a small village called Tubber uh, in the middle of the Burn. And I don't know if any of you know that part of the world. It's a beautiful part of the world, but also a, an impoverished part of the world and a, a bleak uh, and deserted part of the world from which there was a tremendous amount of uh, immigration over many years. So Tom was uh, born and grew up in Chicago uh, in um, uh, interesting, turbulent uh, uh, times and so on. So when Tom uh, is coming back to Ireland, bringing us uh, uh, not just a returning immigrant's experience, but also the, um, the experience of an Irish-American who had come of age intellectually and politically in, in uh, one of the most interesting cities in one of the most interesting regions uh, um, uh, uh, of, the, of, of the world. And he brings with him uh, a lot of inheritance in terms of the politics and uh, uh, theory debates and uh, academic debates that were going on in uh, that uh, time and place. And I think it was uh, an amazing piece of serendipity because I didn't realize quite what Rowena's talk was going to be uh, just uh, th this morning, uh, but Rowena uh, presented us first with the the founding documents of uh, American civilization, uh, which struck me, of course, thinking of them as utopian documents and, and almost uh, futuristic documents of their time. And we hear them now um, 
with a, an ear, as it were, that uh, hears them as kind of echoes, maybe, of a, a, a faded moment or a moment that needs to be revitalized and so on. So that was absolutely perfect. And then Rowena finished her conversation, or the dialogue uh, paused, with the question of, well, what is to be done? You know, where do we go from here? And that seems to be a perfect setup for introducing Tom and for Tom's interview this afternoon, because that, more than anything else, Tom drawing from um, the same time and place, uh, uh, America through a period of great transformation, <coughs> through a period of great hope, a great advancement and so on, and also into the present, uh, the, uh, some very dark days and very dark times. And still Tom is, I'd have to say, one of the most hopeful and one of the most uh, naturally predisposed utopian people you, you'll ever meet in terms of his uh, uh, always his ability to see light, to see possibilities, to see hope and so on and so forth. So that's, I would hope that maybe we can pick up from Rowena's conversation earlier and Tom's interview now to address the quest, the kinds of questions that are on everybody's lips these days. You know, where are we? How do we get here? And more importantly, how can we, as it were, imagine our way out of, out, out of this context? So that's all by way of a, of a prelude. And maybe I want to begin by asking Tom mm. to, if you would reflect, Tom, on your, your formative years and your formative experiences intellectually and politically, and okay. share that with us. Okay. First of all, thank you for that introduction. Can you hear me? I'm going to have to speak up. Uh, thank you, Karen, and also thank you, Ray and Tom, uh, and everybody who organized this. Uh, I know Karen's been trying to get me here for several years, and I'm very happy that I finally made it. Uh, Ray talked about the, the kind of his hope that this not be discovered, this week not be discovered by the institution. And that to me is the definition of a utopian space. We, I, I consider this essentially uh, an occupied utopian zone uh, for the week. And I participate in other uh, occupied zones like this. And these are really important. Uh, to be with each other, to prepare each other as we go back into the world. Um, I, if you know the Robert Heinlein uh, science fiction novel, Stranger in a Strange Land, uh, it, it's, even if you don't, it's one of the better known ones. And I describe being a utopian subject as, as being a stranger in a familiar land. Um, and we were talking the other day about double movement and, and that led to a conversation about double consciousness. And I guess to me, uh, as someone who is of the utopian persuasion, I always feel like I'm elsewhere while I'm here. And so there's that, there's that sense of, of duality, um, which allows for a defamiliarization that, that's very helpful and which allows then for the insights um, that the utopian problematic can make available. I, as Kieran said, I, I grew up in, a, in an Irish working class neighborhood in, in Chicago, uh, very much of a Polish neighborhood uh, in post-war Chicago. Um, there were very few books in my, in my house. There was a medical dictionary and a Bible, and the medical dictionary was out of date. I, was the Bible out of date? <laughs> Um, so I, I very quickly discovered two sources of reading. Uh, one, because besides being a, a nasty street kid, I was also a good student, and the nuns uh, turned me on to the lives of the saints. Um, and it's those narratives of, of people who find their vocation and then act on it that, that very much captured my imagination. And then, of course, I discovered the library, and this starts to touch on Rowena's uh, talk. There was a series of uh, young, what they now call young adult, um, historical uh, narratives about the, the youth of great American heroes. George Washington Carver, George Washington, Marie Curie, and so forth. And it talked about how they came to consciousness to take on their vocation and become the, the purveyors of that American promise that, that Rowena talked about. And so right from the beginning, there's, there's a sense of alienation and hope going on in my life and a sense of vocation 
uh, and a sense of wanting to make the world a better place. Uh, for a long time, that was a very religiously um, motivated uh, desire. And then very much, uh, I talked to Rowena about it, one of my strongest feelings at the end of her talk was nostalgia, as in the, the original use by Napoleon's soldiers as, as the homesickness. Um, and it was a nostalgia for that, that utopian promise of the common good, of, of the utopian America. The great utopian philosopher Ernst Bloch, uh, whose Principle of Hope I recommend you all read, all three volumes, uh, read it like you're listening to jazz, that's the way he writes. Um, he always talked about the utopian surplus that's available throughout history, the, the unfulfilled uh, promises of that common good. Um, and that's how I see what Rowena was talking about, the, the unfulfilled promise of America as utopia. Uh, Woody Guthrie's Your Land is My Land uh, probably started it for me. Martin Luther King's I Have Dream continued it. But what I was going to say is, is uh, gradually I became involved in the politics of civil, the civil rights movement in my latter years of high school. Uh, both as an activist and as a journalist. And the, from the per popular front of the 1930s all the way through into post-war America, the left, the progressive movement, always in invoked America as utopia. They weren't afraid to be patriotic in that Jeffersonian democratic way. That this was the unfulfilled utopian surplus that was available. Uh, and so I was motivated by, by that sense of making the world better and then doing it in terms of the American promise. Um, now the Vietnam War and the exercise of, of American power started to, and I think this is where the break comes, started to destroy that, that promise of America as utopia. Uh, but I was doing two things besides reading the historical fiction, I, at the age of 10, reached up and picked down my first science fiction novel. Uh, and uh, is Wendy here? We, we talked about being science fiction fans from a very early time. And, and that was a formative moment. I, I read Robert Heinlein, you know, an American libertarian writer, um, and I was hooked. They talk about science fiction uh, at the time, in the 50s, as being dangerous for you. It, it would destroy your mind just like rock and roll. As, as a good Catholic boy, I didn't know about sex. Um, took a long time to get to that point. But science fiction does destroy your mind. It's a subversive activity uh, because of its capacity for defamiliarization. It presents a different view of the present, a torqued view of the present that shows us that present in a different light. And in the 50s, under McCarthyism, science fiction just skirted under the radar. It, it wasn't repressed the way the Hollywood narratives were and so forth. And so I think a generation of people who later became the activists of the 60s were already being subverted by, by reading science fiction, at least I was. So right from the beginning, there's this sense of vocation and this sense of reading, which more and more got connected with the sense of activism. The civil rights movement took me into college. I gave up being a medical student and became an English major so that I could be a teacher. Um, and then there were two radicalizing moments for me that were, I think, proto-utopian. I, I wasn't thinking in terms of the category of utopia yet. One was the, was the draft. You know, the Vietnam War was going on. People were being drafted. and. Much as I had marched for civil rights and been arrested for civil rights and marched and been arrested for the war, the draft was part of that 60s politics of choice. Women were facing it in terms of their own reproductive rights. Men were facing it in terms of the decision, do I join the war machine or not? Uh, and that decision to say no was both radicalizing and liberating. That's part of the double consciousness that started to develop. Uh, and why did I say no? Now, not out of a sense of nihilism, but out of a sense of hope. That the world could be better if we practiced nonviolence and if we worked for peace. The second radicalizing moment for me that pulled me from the religious discourse to secular 
was the papal encyclical of 1968, Humanae Vitae. I mean, the, the, the politics of 68 certainly shaped me, but, but it was the Pope's encyclical about contraception and, and a woman's right to choose that finally alienated me from the church. So these were important breaks. But breaks, and I want to come back to that when we talk about theory, <coughs> breaks that didn't just end with the break but led to a hope that the world could be different if we acted differently. Mm -hmm. So I read a lot of books, I marched, I went to a lot of meetings, I got arrested, and there was always this intersection of activism and, and literature. So I was, what was I attracted to in literature? The American tradition, the American novel, the political American novel. And then in graduate school in Milwaukee, I discovered that I could write about science fiction. I had a, I had a Wendy moment. Uh, finally, I could study the very thing that I loved. And I was working then with Jack Sipes, who is one of the founders of the journal New German Critique. And so I, I learned about the Frankfurt School, and I learned about Utopia. That's when I read Ernst Bloch. <laughs> and that, was, that <coughs> was the change. And at the time in the 70s, there was a different kind of utopian novel being written. It was, a, it was a novel growing out of the activism of the moment. Thomas More, who founds the genre, and it is a, a production of modernity, we were talking about that this morning, presents us with a system and expects us to, to look at that system as a way of critiquing the present. William Morris, this is a very quick history of Utopia and about three novels. William Morris in News from Nowhere in, in 1880 uh, not only writes about this future better world, and mind you, it's always a matter of a better world, not a perfect world. Perfect is the bad rap that's put on Utopian. That, that, that's the negative use of Utopian. Um, but a better world. What Morris does is write about the transition. How do people organize how do people move from the bad present to the new future, political work? But then in the 70s, because of the new left, because of feminism, because of the early ecology moment, movement, there were a number of utopian novels being written. And this is what I did my, my dissertation on. Um, and I called them the critical utopias. And that name has stuck, that concept has stuck. Now, in a sense, all utopias are critical narrative utopias, because they, they break with the present and they offer a, a possible new world. What was important in these novels, and a lot like them, Colin Bach's Ecotopia is another, and we were talking about this in the reading group this morning, was their, their inclusion of self-reflexivity and criticism, self-criticism in the utopian process. That the utopian process wasn't the authoritarian imposition of a, of a plan. The utopian process was the movement toward a better world through organizing and political action, but always being open to critique. And I think uh, we are, Tristan was raising questions like that, talking about his own practice this morning. You know, how, how do you keep refining the, the utopian movement? But it's never a matter of arriving at utopia. It's a matter of moving toward the horizon, uh, and that's the motivating force. While I was writing this, I was teaching at a two-year community college, so I really didn't need to do a PhD. Um, I was teaching full-time. I had given up a full five-year PhD scholarship uh, because it was funded by the National Defense Foundation, and I didn't want to have anything to do with the military, so I, I gave it up and took a teaching job and just wrote the dissertation because I wanted to write the dissertation. So I'm teaching by day, raising my two kids as a co-parent, going to meetings and causing trouble at night and on weekends, and trying to write a dissertation. And that finally led to my first book um, okay. you know, sometime in the 80s. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Interesting range of influences from the lives of the saints to uh, uh, um, Ernst Bloch and the a few radicalizing moments in there in the, in the, in the middle. Um, Maybe I could ask you of the many things we could talk about and many influences and so on and so forth, maybe two that stand out because they're kind of well known across the social sciences and humanities. And that would be, uh, on the one hand, uh, Fred Jameson, the, the literary uh, critic at Duke, 
uh, famously the essay on the postmodern condition and so on, but more besides. And the other person who uh, seems to be important to you intellectually in terms of people you've engaged with and so on is the English sociologist Ruth Levitas. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your relationship with Fred um, and with Ruth? As it happens, these are the two founding or two key points in my own work. Ooh. Is Fred Jameson's and, and Ruth's. Um, and I have had my debates and my collaborations with both of them, and basically I position my own work as a, as a dialectical uh, conjunction of the two of them. Mm -hmm. I met, Jack Sipes introduced me to Fred's work uh, in the 70s. And at that time, Fred and another sociologist, Stanley Aronowitz, started the Marxist Literary Group. And they began a summer institute on, in, on culture and society. That's why I said I've been here before. This, this was a magical three weeks uh, in St. Cloud, Minnesota. About 40 of us, um, people who were from all the left political movements uh, to people just starting to do what was being known as critical theory, came together for three weeks. And it was like a page out of the German ideology. Fred or Stanley lectured in the morning. We constituted study groups in the afternoon. We smoked dope and danced and, and read poetry to each other in the evening. Um, arguments were made, alliances were made of all sorts, broken up, changed again, and it drove the work of a whole generation of people. The summer institutes continued for three weeks, for three years, and then they still continue now. They run for a week. But Fred's work, the postmodern <coughs> essay is important, but the key books for me were Marxism and Form his early studies of Adorno and Bloch. And it's the conversation of Adorno and Bloch that for me was, was crucial. Um, in fact, there's a lovely interview between Adorno and Bloch in a collection called Something's Missing, edited by Jack Sipes, in which Adorno becomes the utopian and Bloch becomes the, the, the dark side. Uh, it's really a lovely, lovely piece. Fred's insight to utopia is that and of course he's a literature person and he studies narrative, but his argument is that the big secret of about utopia is that it's impossible to exist in the world in which it's presently constituted. Uh, and he talks in terms of the utopian problematic, which he uh, describes as the set of categories by which we interrogate the world. And for him the primary move of the utopian problematic is that of negation. Mm. You know, the critique of the present, the negation of the present, the, the taking of a hard look at the present, and this is what science fiction helps us to do, this is what political action helps us to do. Um, because the danger in utopia lies in its all too easy positivity. If you move to the positive, to the plan, to the answer, too soon, if you, if you don't have that sense of the negation, then you're going to end up with either all the things that the anti-utopians accuse us of, an authoritarian or an idle dream uh, solution. So Fred is important on that mm. sense, and, and besides Marxism and Form, the other key book for me was The Political Unconscious, where he writes about the interplay between ideology and utopia, mm -hmm. and he describes how the effectively ideological has to be utopian you know, because you need that hook. And, and we're caught in a contest over the utopian and I think that's very much what made me think of Rowena's talk today. There's a battle for the meaning of America as utopia. And I think one of the things we have to do with Trump is accuse him of being anti-American. Um, you know, we need to reclaim the utopian. So, Fred's talking about negativity. He's talking about openness and mm. very much mm -hmm. part of that postmodernist era. Ruth, as a sociologist who doesn't come out of literature, who began studies as an architect, which I think is crucial, uh, and then moved to sociology. And of course, a lot of you would know her work on social exclusion. Uh, but Ruth is also from the, the communist hierarchy of Britain. Her father was, was head of the British Communist Party. She herself was, whether she was in or out, but she was affiliated 
and so she very much comes out of the, the what Badiou would call the communist hypothesis. Hmm. And and again, there's as as does Fred, and, and and again, there's that resonance between the political and and the theoretical that that I would identify with. Ruth writes a critique of my first book, Demand the Impossible, and implicitly a critique of Fred, and says all this postmodern openness is just too much for me. You know, there's there's just You've gone too far with negativity. You've got too far with openness. What we need is the taking of positions. What we need is judgment. What we need are some provisional plans, not authoritarian plans, but some ways to move forward. Uh, and she then did a lot of work, which began at the Rallaheim Center, on utopia as method. So you've got Fred talking about the utopian problematic, and you've got Ruth talking about method. And by then, I'm embracing the two. And to her, the utopian method, the imaginary reconstitution of society as a form of social change, comes down to three things. Critique of the present, teasing out of the tendencies and latencies, as Bloch would call it, of the possibilities in the present that could make that present radically different. And then the ontology of the utopian subject, who under an act of secular grace, undergoes a turn and becomes the utopian radical, the utopian activist. So where my work has been going is, is a series of essays that have been either a, a critique of Fred or an embrace, a critique of Ruth or an embrace. And I'm just finishing up that collection now and trying to write an introduction to it, um, which is saying in, in uh, Maggie's reading group this morning in a, in a kind of auto autobiography, or can we call it auto autoethnography? I, I'm just learning. Um, I'm thinking about my own moments of radicalization, and that's why I'm going back to the, to the lives of the saints and so forth. When did the gestalt shift happen to make me a bad subject? When does the gestalt shift happen to make us utopians? You know. And, and it, it, it isn't always a Pauline moment. It isn't always a sudden one. It, it can often be a drip-free feed. But there is a, a break. And then from that break, necessarily something positive. So you have to get up after the break and go out and organize the next morning. So I really consider my work as a teacher to be primary and as a political organizer. And, and then I do my writing. Um, but Fred and Ruth are really the twin pillars. And behind the two of them is Ernst Bloch. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, they both draw on Bloch. Right. Okay. And Tom, you've mentioned on a number of occasions now that science fiction as uh, the lives of the saints and then the discovery of science fiction. And I know you've been centrally involved in the Journal of Science Fiction Studies and the whole debate and uh, conversation around that for many years. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Go into it in some detail and tell us, you know, what, what kinds of science fiction, how do they inspire you, why the interest, how they're brought a relevance, and so on. You know, Fred, Fred uh, agrees with Darko Suvin's point that, that utopian fiction, even though it was written in the 1500s onward, is, is a form of science fiction, uh, which comes along with Wells. Uh, so there's this nice discontinuity. Uh, and I would consider the lives of the saints now as a form of science fiction. Hmm. Um, and that's, that's a compliment. Uh, to the lives of the saints. Um, what does science fiction do? It, 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 it either takes us into the very far future uh, and gives us uh, a narrative in which our present is the past of that future, or with William Gibson and the cyberpunks, it takes us 20 minutes in the future, as you've seen in a lot of the recent dystopian films. So science fiction is, is really not about the future. It's really not about predicting the future. It's, it's a defamiliarized way in the, in the sense of Heidegger, but more so Brecht, um, of talking about the present. My first readings in science fiction, my first love was Robert Heinlein, who, you know, as, as I moved to the left, I, I had to come to terms with. But, you know, he was a good, radical American libertarian. Uh, an anarchist. Um, and he wrote two very important novels. I've read them all, you know, but Stranger in a Strange Land. And again, there's that narrative of the alien who comes to our world. 
This gets reprised in, in uh, David Bowie's film, The Man Who Fell to Earth, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Which, which I think is a, is a beautiful uh, rendition, not exactly of Stranger in the Strange Land, but it's in the same spirit. Uh, and it's through the eyes of the alien that our world is seen. And it's through the eyes of the science fiction writer that our world is seen. So there is that estrangement effect. And then Heinlein writes uh, Moon is a Harsh Mistress, which is an anarchist revolutionary novel in which the, the workers on, on the moon colony basically revolt and take over. It's, it's, it's one of the great American political novels. Um, so he was important. He was very important. But then the writers of the 70s, uh, probably the main one would be Ursula K. Le Guin, um, who combines Taoism, anarchism, left-wing anarchism and, and feminism and ecology. Mm -hmm. and writes The Dispossessed, which is a novel about a utopian society on a moon of a, a very less utopian planet, um, and shows how the people in that society have, have encountered what I call the utopian half-life. All utopias run down. They're either defeated from the outside or, or defeated from the inside by, by virtue of authority or corruption or privilege or whatever. And she narrates the way in which the, the younger generation on this, in this, in this anarchist moon uh, set on a desert planet, which is interesting, it's all about the politics of scarcity, um, reignite the utopian promise, reignite the utopian promise of the founders of that society and, and use it to, to carry on to the next generation. Joanna Russ in The Female Man writes one of the, the best feminist utopias of all time. Uh, March Piercy, the activist and writer, uh, Women on the Edge of Time, writes about a future society which has become utopian in all the best senses of the new left feminism ecology, uh, which has a form of time travel. And they contact a woman of the 1970s in New York, um, a Chicana woman, a uh, single mother, Who's, who's being knocked around by the welfare system, and they recruit her as an activist. And it's her actions in the present that lead to that, through the joys of time travel, hmm. to, to that new moment. And then Samuel R. Delaney, the, the gay, black, New York science fiction writer, writes one of the best utopian, or uh, urban utopian novels in Triton. Um, so those are key. <laughs> Once, mm -hmm. yeah. Both, both dystopian and utopian. Well, How the do you thing see the about the critical utopias yeah. is, is that the, the, the world, even though it's utopian, has the, a, a dystopian side. Things don't work well. Mm -hmm. Th there are the classic dystopias, because after writing about the utopian novels in the 70s and publishing that in the 80s, I took a break and I did some work on liberation theology and the utopian uh, material, uh, especially in Gustavo Gutierrez, mm -hmm. who, who uses the problematic and the term utopia uh, mm -hmm. directly, uh, went back through Bloch and then ended up in the 90s, there was a new set of writing of dystopias, obviously, with mm -hmm. Thatcher saying there is no alternative, with Reagan doing what he's doing, it's no surprise that neoliberalism has generated the dystopian novel. But even in these dystopian novels, there's hope because there is the narrator who finds, who's disillusioned, who makes the break, and then who starts building mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, an opposite movement. The Handmaid's Tale would be a, mm -hmm. a good example. But then, yeah, I'll get to the present. Later. Sure, because I, I, I guess, you know, what I'd like you to talk about now would be um, your engagement with the, the canon, let's say, because science fiction is a very particular genre and uh, um, uh, it has a great popularity and it's one of these ways in which literature permeates mass culture and so on and so forth. But um, you're also, uh, first and foremost, I, I suppose, um, a, a, a scholar of literature in the modern uh, Anglo-American canon. Do you want to tell us a little bit about your key influences, sources, engagements, debates there that you've been that have been important to you? Um, I pretty quickly moved into science fiction, so I was influenced more by that, but I wrote my bachelor's thesis on John Dos Passos, mm -hmm. who was uh, an American uh, 
writer of the 20s, 30s, and 40s, and his USA trilogy is, is one of the great political novels of, of the left in the 1930s. And uh, I was very much writing about him and his work through the lens of Sartre and existentialism. Uh, but it was always a matter of reading the American political novel mm -hmm. and, and the American protagonist as a potential uh, political agent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I suppose this takes us to the present moment, the time we live in. Um, and I'm thinking of um, a famous text in philosophy um, that picks up some of the terms that are very important to you but are deeply problematic also and that's the, the famous book by Nozick called uh, Anarchy, State and Utopia yeah. and so on and in some ways we're living in the realization of <laughs> that particular dream uh, utopian in a sense, dystopian in a sense and so on but it also falls then to uh, you and uh, your experience and your engagement with that literature and so on to to speak to um, our times, I guess, and say, well, uh, how would you, from your background and engagement and your influences and so on, uh, speak to the kinds of problems that uh, uh, Rowena mapped out very well uh, for us earlier? Because uh, you were sitting alongside me and I could see you were uh, chomping at the bit. Let's <laughs> say, uh, so do you want to take that up? Well, I end, up, I end up, I, I, I begin writing where Rowena ended, um, you know, what is to be done? Uh, we're, we're in a dire dystopian time. Mm. Uh, but I think the role of activists is to not give up, to keep organizing, mm -hmm. but to do it in a way that works towards solidarity and unity among movements, the way the, the 1930s Popular Front did, the way the 1950s and 60s Civil Rights Movement did, um, a politics of uh, micro-politics, just working out of your own particular needs isn't enough. That can be picked off too easily. So there's a need uh, for, for more solidarity politics than anything else. How and where to do that depends on where you are and, and that's a hard one. Um, I think the role of, of intellectuals, and I'm very comfortable with that word, I'm more comfortable with the word intellectual than I am with the word scholar. Um, mm -hmm. The role of intellectuals, people who, who think and write and intervene uh, for our vocation, is to not give in to that overwhelming dystopian imagination. Uh, there's just so many quotations lately of The Handmaid's Tale of 1984 uh, saying we are in dystopian times, we are in dystopian, okay, okay, so we are, yeah, things are very bad, but that's not sufficient. Mm. We have to speak hope to power, um, and again, how to do that. There's some very good science fiction writers writing utopian fiction again. Tim Stanley Robinson, I don't know how many of you know his work, uh, American science fiction writer, particularly of an ecological bent, but he has written carefully about the, the ecological and economic destruction of the world, um, but then narrating forms of political resistance and revolution and change. His Mars trilogy starts with the colonization of Mars, then there's a revolution a la Heinlein by the Martian settlers to declare independence from the oppressive earth. But then there's a second revolution because, of course, the first one doesn't go far enough. Mm. Um, he also writes a lot about the utopian potential of science. Um, and he's a, he he's works closely with, with progressive scientists and so forth and mm -hmm. has taken on the climate change debate. China Mieville is, is the British writer who uh, is, I think, writing some great political science fiction. His <laughs> novel, The Iron Council, uh, again deals with a narrative of, uh, of revolution. So two key, two key words. One is um, hopefulness and um, 
articulating some sort of a basis or some sort of an imaginary of hope and the other one is um, solidarity was the other, the other key term. Could you say a little bit more about both of those? In, in other words, well, um, speak hope to power. That, that, that's wonderful. Um, how, uh, w what form does that take? Can you, drawing from whatever sources you've mentioned there, you know, that, that might speak hope to, to, to the present situation? A political friend of mine sometime a long time ago talked about the, the need to look for the juggler vein. The need, the need to look for the, mm. the juggler vein. The, the, the contradiction where you can get the most out of an issue where you can really organize. Mm. Um, and I think it's very important for people to, to work together to do that. I mm -hmm. hear wonderful things here this week about social justice. And mm. this gives me a lot of hope that, that people are trying to work their way through. And it, it, it begins with small things. So I have, I have no problem with reformist politics. I'm not talking about some big, mm. you know, mystical, hopeful revolution. I'm talking about the hard work of gradually, slowly changing society, but always changing it so that the next door opens. Mm. Not changing it and being happy with, with a few mm. achievements, mm. But, but moving forward and, and trying to work together um, both within the academy and outside the academy. And that's why I find working with architects so interesting, because they're, they're you know, redesigning space, and especially at the, at the architecture school at UL, uh, they're, they're providing sort of the grassroots mm -hmm. uh, critique of the official Limerick regeneration going down. They're trying to work with changing, changing the city from the, from the bottom up. Um, the, the, the connection of residents and architects, I think, is a fruitful one. Which um, resonates very nicely with uh, Bjorn's uh, talk uh, yesterday, because you used the image there uh, you know, th th as it were going for the crucial issue or something like that. But it seems that maybe contemporary utopian discourse um, does much better by not necessarily focusing on the big, the big issue, but, but the small, beautiful thing, the, the lived space, the uh, the face-to-face uh, the -face community. The, uh, uh, and I know you've been closely involved in that, for instance, in the Clark Jordan Eco Village and other uh, elective communities and so on. You have to work from those moments, but always, again, this is that double movement or double consciousness, always with a sense of the bigger yeah. step. Mm -hmm. And that's why I found Bjorn's first two examples to be strongly utopian. And Eric mm -hmm. Olin Wright, whose work I don't always completely agree with in his book on real utopias, has done a series of case studies of programs like this around around the world. Um, the one I always find interesting is the, uh, in, in, uh, is Pilar here, the, the, the town in, uh, in Brazil that has a participatory budget mm -hmm. where the residents of the town actually identify what needs to be done and debate the spending and work out a budget. Uh, it's not in the hands of the managers. But, and both of Bjorn, your examples, I think, are examples of utopian interventions <coughs> which are of themselves important in the moment, but they have consequences that carry forward. And as they expand globally, those consequences expand globally. And this is why the, the program in the 30s gets shut down, because it's threatening. Mm -hmm. you know, you, it can't be allowed to go. So there has to be the insistence of the utopian mm -hmm. constantly. And, and that's the work, and that's why I go back to the, to the roles of teacher and organizer. Not teacher as indoctrinator, but teacher in that self-reflexive way of, of nurturing and, and bringing out uh, a different way of seeing the world um, with all due respect to trigger warnings and everything else, uh, but disturbing the universe of students and helping people see things differently and make up their own minds. When I was a, a selective service counselor, I, I actually helped, after becoming a conscientious objector myself, I worked with others um, because as, as a young American male between the ages of 18 and 26, you, you were in what they called a forced choice context. Mm. You either went or you went to jail. Mm. You, mm -hmm. know, you didn't have any choice. Our work is to show people they had alternatives. Mm -hmm. And then it's up to the person to decide. Mm -hmm. Legal alternatives, illegal alternatives, but mm -hmm. it was their existential decision to do that. Um, I'm going to open up the conversation in, in, in a moment, but um, 
maybe before we do that, I wanted you maybe to uh, reflect and share with us your reflections on uh, what it is to be a teacher these days. Um, I'm conscious of the extent to which uh, uh, this is a summer school. There's a number. Most people here are working on their PhDs, working towards a, a future career in the academy. Uh, in a context that's changing very often for the worse, uh, quite different from uh, the context that you came of age in or others of us came of age in, but still there are things that remain constant, steady, ideals that you want to remain true to. Yeah, they're, they're and you know, there's the, the whole, who am I to say anything about the present? I'm teaching a lot less and I'm, I'm not facing the kind of precarious conditions that almost everybody in academia is facing so I'm not I'm not one to to preach about that but there was a precariousness when I first started teaching in 1968 especially if you were male because if you didn't get through your course you were on the boat to Vietnam hmm. you know it was it was an existential precariousness not a, not an economic but it was economic as well um, I'll start my 50th year of teaching in October or September or whatever that is, um, and I still love it. I still get nervous the night before I get to get up to teach. Um, it's it's working with people to to learn to see the world in a bigger way. I had a teacher in college, Brother K. Basil O'Leary, a Christian brother, a good Christian brother, as opposed to the nasty ones, who said my job in teaching you, and he taught us economics, theology, and literature. Um, he was quite a guy. But he said, my job is to disturb your universe. My job is to, is, to, is to help you unlearn everything you've learned up until now, and then to start to put it together on your own terms. Uh, and I've carried that with me. Um, it's, it's my first love. And I think I write as a teacher. My second book was criticized for being too pedagogical, and I took that as a, as a compliment. Mm -hmm. But the other analog, the other, not the other analog, but the other activity is that of organizing. Mm -hmm. and, and, and the act of being an organizer is not the act of being a commissar. You know, you're not telling people what to do. You're teasing out possibilities. You're, you know, I was very, I, whatever has happened to Saul Alinsky and, and his work and however much that's been co-opted by liberal Catholicism, in the early days as a community organizer in Chicago, he really learned how to move into a neighborhood and to work with people, to listen, we were talking about listening this morning, to listen, to hear the pain, to hear the issues, and then to say, well, what are we going to do about that? And I think that's very much part of the teaching mm -hmm. vocation. And I, and I would claim the word vocation. Um, Still very much a vocation then, and that's something that uh, hasn't uh, changed, maybe, but the, the conditions of living it possibly have become more fraught. More fraught, and I think we have to learn to support each other more. Uh, there has to be a lot more solidarity between those who are secure and those who are insecure. And we have to look, my, my friend Darren Webb at, uh, teaches in education at Sheffield, uh, is doing a lot of work on other educational forms outside the university. And how do we do that? How do we create new spaces to talk to each other? Um, I think we're just, I mean, I was very influenced, I'm still very influenced by Paulo Freire uh, in his dialogical, critical pedagogy. Um, but that project, and that's back to Rowena's point, that we need to teach the common good again. We need to find ways to claim the common good and to teach it. And that is a utopian term. That's a utopian category. Uh, but it's robust, and as Ernst Block would say, it's concrete. It's not just some abstract mm -hmm. desire for a better world, but it's the concrete instantiation of a better world, which happens step by step. It happens by repair shops. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It happens by political campaigns. It happens by the plastic bag tax in Ireland. Mm -hmm. You know, that didn't save the world, but it, it, it was a step. Mm -hmm. you know. Well, maybe um, tacking now both uh, Rowena's talk earlier and Tom's talk just now, uh, because so many questions have been raised and we've reached in many 
parts of our conversation, dark places, uh, places, places, places that's hard to be hopeful in, and so on. And still, we have um, we have a basis for a conversation about what to do, how to imagine our way out of this, and so on. So, I'd invite maybe questions that we'll pick up on Rowena's earlier presentation and Tom's now, and we'll see where we can go with that. So, would anybody like to come in on this, Yanis? Uh, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm actually a great fan of science fiction myself, and it's a great honor. Um, I have a few questions, but I, I think the one that to connect to, to Kieran better is... I always wondered about how much are we actually, 2017, falling into some kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of dystopian novels, or utopian novels that have been, or movies for that matter, that we've seen. I mean, I saw my shoes and I thought that, I think I saw them in Kubrick's uh, 2001. Yeah. Others in space, I mean, and <laughs> we're kind of yeah. going into some kind of vision we had of what the future is supposed to be. And we're talking about the transhuman movement and yeah, whatnot, exactly. about transforming ourselves into machines. And I'm wondering, is this, are we forcing this somewhat? Are we yeah. trying to fulfill these visions and dreams we had, we read about, we saw in comic books? Are we trying to make them real, or yeah. what, where are we heading towards? This, this is exactly it, and, and this is why I, I say this, this dystopian moment needs to be critically addressed. Okay, we're in it, now what? And, and having conversation this morning about technology, you know, are we being driven by our technology, or can we reclaim that, as, as Kim Stanley Robinson would argue, as a, as a utopian tool? Um, you know, it suits the neoliberal subjectification process, if I can get back to Carmen's talk, to have us think and feel this, this dystopian structure of feeling. And Raymond Williams, by the way, is another very important person for me. And we're, we're living in a dystopian structure of feeling that ought to be provoking us to act radically, to change it. But what it's doing exactly what you're talking about for most people. It's, it's engulfing us in almost the pleasures of the dystopian. Yeah. You know, we're, we're wallowing in it. We're reveling in it. And that's why I think the utopian voice in that has to say, wait, stop, it doesn't have to be this way. R Ruth begins her, her book saying, Utopia says two things, th that the world has, doesn't have to be the way it is, and we can do something about it. But people aren't thinking in that way. But all of the tropes, all of the representations, the films, the novels, the, the huge, I think, complicated, phenomenon of the young adult novels. The Hunger Games being the most exemplary. Um, yeah, they're, they're, they're provocative, but they're also recuperative. You know, they, they just pull people back into this closed dystopian loop. I mean, there's a danger there. We have a question from a young man at the very back. <laughs> Not so young <laughs> anymore. Um, a question that, that um, does 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 span the two talks, but maybe doesn't have that quality of hopefulness or um, answering the question of what should be done. But the, uh, the, 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 the many of the things that, that, that both of you brought up, I, I thought I, I, I felt the same concern about. You know, um, uh, and just just to resume it in this way, you know, the, this question of uh, be the. the of negativity which you raised, you know, of, of critiquing the present in a very different way than, than you're imagining. Uh, Trump and his supporters do this. Steve Bannon will say we're living in, you know, a terrible age because of this. And, and, and he would present himself as a critic and Trump would present himself as a critic. The anti-feminists would present themselves as a critic and this, this is problematic. And um, interestingly, you know, um, uh, there's, there's, this, there's this sort of structure uh, identified by, I can't pronounce the name, but the American Jeremiah, this sort of thing of, it used to be better, but we must, we must return to all of that. We must return to something better. And something of that, I think, lingers in many of our conversations, but is also played on by the likes of Trump. So we turn back to the good old days when the rust belt wasn't rusty and, you know, everything was shiny new. So the interesting problem with, with negativity and critique is that it's, it's, it's that it can be so easily co-opted and used to, 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 to other alternative terrible purposes. Um, 
so I don't, this, this is simply raising the concern, I suppose, around that. Uh, the, perhaps, perhaps, the hopefulness is that, well, I mean, if, 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 if that's, if that's, if that's where the, uh, where the game is at, but where, where the, the alternative is not to double down on negativity and critique and the Jeremiah and, and polemic, but to, um, to return to a sort of hopefulness and to, to recapture imaginative ideas of, well, what, what could be better? Other norms, other moralities, other inspirations, other, tr other traditions. So rather than negative, I'm sort of, I suppose, with Ruth in this, yeah. to look, you know, rather, rather than that. So. This is why I, I, I need Ruth on that side, you know. Um, you answered your own question, really, but, but you know, it, 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 the now cliche, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Um, and, and Fred has talked about the, um, the necessity now of anti-anti-utopianism. That the negative, the critique, needs to be applied to the negative. The critique needs to be applied to this dystopian moment. Um, that needs to be cracked open in order to get the Leonard Cohen like light coming through. Uh, or as Joe Hill famously sang, don't mourn and organize. Um, you know, but, but yeah, the, the, the negativity has to be challenged. The hegemonic negativity, if I could use that word, yeah. Mm -hmm. not, not the critical negativity. Um, so we need, to, we need to push that. Okay, so I think the sequence is here. Arpad, <coughs> Nagi, yes, well, and oh, Federica. Yeah. Okay, and so that's, Rowena, that's our sequence. Roll in, you know, okay, yeah. so okay, actually, my question refers a bit to, to the previous one uh, because you know the, the sci-fi utopia is not just the domain of leftist agenda at all. That's what it is. Yeah. Uh, and I am familiar with many, many books, many types of like are pretty conservative. Uh, and I wanted to ask you if you are familiar. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, how, how do you perceive this kind of yeah, that is trying to re-establish yeah. the, the, the old order, the, the old set of rules that conservative sci-fi sci is you know, I, uh, I might give you an example of, of many Polish titles. Yeah? I mean, the, the Polish sci-fi literature used to have like great traditions based on, based on things of men and, yeah. and authors like that, but then suddenly in the 80s, the people who were fighting the communist system to the sci-fi because they could like yeah. no uh, escape the censorship yeah uh, and then the, the communist system failed um, but they they were still there and they were still writing uh, like very right-wing and conservative utopia against the European Union and the Euro communist and they are like still present there and they produce like very strong conservative agenda and as far as I know it they, 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 they books are like best-selling books yeah that's, a, that's very important. In fact, I thank you for that because that was the other half of what I wanted to say to Tom. Um, utopia is, is not an inherently progressive problematic or method. <coughs> it's, it's a procedure that's available to whoever wants to take on that amount of radical change. So yes, Trump's movement is evoking a utopian image of America that is motivating a lot of people and, and your examples would do the same. So, And this is why I think one has to be critically cautious uh, when being a utopian critic or being a utopian practitioner that, that there's, there's really a battle for the utopian. The utopian isn't in and of itself a good thing but it's available to be a good thing but it can easily motivate the other side. And there's a whole line of science fiction that's you know, in, 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 to take the division in, in the prophetic and apocalyptic books of the Bible. Uh, the apocalyptic books are, are looking at the end of the world and the world's going to end and, and God will resolve everything. The prophetic are saying, you know, get your act together. You know, the Jeremiah is, is at least a warning, which implies that that change can be engaged. And so we have to think about that. And there's there's almost this this end of you know take a take a book like uh, McCarthy's The Road, you know that that you know off celebrated dystopian novel, uh, which is really a deeply anti-utopian novel. It, it ends in utter darkness, um, and that needs to be engaged. It needs to be contested. So these aren't these aren't magic bullets. You know these are available forms, and I think we need to look at at activists 
the work of artists, the work of teachers, the work of scholars who, who can tease out what, what Bloch would call the Spuren, the utopian traces that are available, um, and to make them available in a form of interpretive mm -hmm, mm -hmm. activity uh, that moves our imagination away from this dystopian, or I would call anti-utopian structure of feeling, to one that's more engaged. I think it's Arpad, Maggie, Bjorn, Federica. Thank you. Uh, so <coughs> I want to take a few points about combining uh, a question to your presentation and, and Rowena's yeah. because there were really a number of common points. And one of your central sentence was that despair is not sufficient and that is basically where but in Rowena said that both were uh, both of you were about you know what to do in, in this situation. And of course both of you are Americans who are now in Ireland and yeah. try somehow to revitalize or render accessible and valid, a kind of truthful American dream, whatever that is. Mm. Okay, but now um, you mentioned also that uh, this, this ideal, which seems to be almost self-evident, almost that the uh, common good idea is self-evident, uh, make the world a better place. Who, who could, could not agree with it? Uh, I'm sorry, to be rhetorical, I, I don't agree with it. For one particular reason, because I think it's Promethean. That, that is the Promethean project, basically, to rest the world. And how about keeping and restoring? Which is also very utopia. And of course, what, keeping what and restoring what? You can say, you know, that's the project of whoever is made, you know, restore British sovereignty, of course. Who cares about that in social history? But, you know, we have to keep and restore whatever is still valuable. And yeah. we have to recognize whatever is still valuable, keep it and restore it. Anyway, and, but um, it's just an alternative, but I have problems about you know, making a world because we have full of failed projects about how to make the world a better place. And so I, I frankly, together with others like Eskilos, I'm happy with Prometheus and with you. I got what we deserve. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so we have to be careful about, because all the modernity is Promethean, that's back to Goethe and Faust, which, because Goethe wrote Faust after this nothing right on Prometheus. Yep. Yep. Mm. I, I think keep and, keep and preserve especially is apt for the ecological situation, you know, and I, and I can go that far in agreeing. But, uh, you know, Bloch says that, that the, the first uh, utopian emotion comes out of hunger. And, you know, it's easy for us sitting here on this terrace to talk about not making the world a better place. But there's a lot of people, and we were talking about refugees the other day, and there's hungry and there's suffering people. Um, and it seems to me that there's a desire there for something better. And if we are going to be this <coughs> collective human project, then we need to take the risk. I'll, I'll go further. I say we need to take the risk to be Promethean. You know, Promethean was the first secular saint, right? So I, I, I've always, mm. I used to teach a course on the scientist in literature, and I started with Prometheus, and I went all the way up through Frankenstein and, and all the others. Mm. But, you know, I think it's, it's important to take that Promethean risk. Yeah. And here we are in a restored space. Right? This is a rather interesting yeah. from that point yeah. of view. And but one there of is the a dialectic between yeah. preserving and, and bettering. I, yeah. I would agree with you there. Yeah. I wouldn't make that a binary. I'm not yeah. against bettering. Yeah. I'm, not yeah. I'm not against bettering things, but it's making the world a better place. So that behind that, there is a kind of transformative project. Yeah. So of course, there is things to better to anybody, but the bettering can make things worse, and you know, much of uh, much of the refugee is a consequence of different kind of bettering situations. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. W working within traditions means, you know, keeping them alive in, in some way. I'm sorry, Maggie, I didn't mean to. Your turn. Hi, it kind of connects, actually, with um, First of all, I'd like to say that was such an inspiring talk and interview. It was wonderful. Um, and, you know, it was really great connecting to Tom's work and um, also back into, you know, my own uh, kind of previous um, embeddedness in the practice school. So it was lovely for me oh, right, to, yeah. you know, regain your um, but in this, and it kind of connects back to um, the discussion earlier, my recent end, so I'm sure I'm still in the the rest. Um, but it was that notion that we're all a race without democracy. Um, and um, here it invited us to think across the papers. So 
I was thinking about in response to uh, critically addressing the structures of being, um, the work by the Clow and Luke um, and um, Anne Marie Smith on uh, radical democratic imagining mm -hmm. for me is really uh, personal. Of the um, and by that, you know, I guess to describe it would be to open, to keep open. Um, and to allow space for repressed elements of the imaginary. Um, and so just to sort of hang that on an example, um, and you're, you, know, you mentioned Prairie and critical pedagogy, um, there's um, a, a free university um, in Brighton. So in the UK, you know, we have land pay, pay uh, the food, accommodation, all these stuff on top of it, which is, you know, precluding, you know, large numbers of people at access to the university as a conduit. Um, uh, and the, in Brighton there is a free university, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been involved in validating the first two years with Burgess and New York, so we've had the first students graduate in the UK from a free university. Fantastic. But it, there's no physical space for the university, you know, it's a, it, was, it was imagined, it was created by at, at the activism of um, teachers, um, academics, uh, so for me that's a kind of, that's, that's quite an easy example. Incredible example. Yeah. And, and this actually, you know, it's been really inspired. It's only day two, and I'm so inspired. Um, but honestly, this I think, you know, you, you, you point about this as a token space for me. This is a radical democratic space. Um, yeah. You know, it's, 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 it's a space where um, you, you mentioned trust also. So, um, but I think it feels this is this school, this you know, summer school has been going for a while. It feels like there's a sort of embedded um, relation with this. I, I, radical democratic is utopian, and the utopian is radically democratic, at least in my world. But yeah, I, so the the Brighton Free University is certified. Yeah, yeah. And that's fantastic. You know, because there were the 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 uh, the Occupy Free University, and there was the Free University movement in the '60s, but they were always parallel yeah, yeah. structures. They it, were. It is, it is parallel, and that's you know, people did their labor. Yeah, um, yeah. Community centers are free mm -hmm. spaces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, everything is on computers. There's no, there's no cost in terms of because there is no mm -hmm. funding, mm -hmm. um, and there's no contribution. Mm -hmm. Everything. Mm -hmm. really. So um, it's kind of yeah. Well, that connects. That's an example equivalent to Bjorn's first two, I think. You know, just to say on Leclau and Mouf in in my second book on the on the critical dystopias of the 90s. Um, Leclau and Mouffe feature at the core of that because within these these dystopian novels by Octavia Butler, Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, another one by Marge Piercy, are you know this this hegemonic dystopia is available, but but the movements that grow are very much in the spirit of Leclau and Mouffe's new social movements and radical democracy, and that's that's and of course these are being written in the 90s when Leclau and Mouffe have just finished doing their work. Yeah, I think that's a really important connection. Just to say one more thing, the other for me really important aspect of the free university is that it's open to asylum seekers. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah. you know, asylum seekers and refugees who would have no or refugees could do that they had to do with things. Mm -hmm. um, but asylum seekers, and particularly if you're in the asylum system for a long time, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can, there is that it's open to that's great. We we could do with that here, for yeah. the, especially for the direct provision mm -hmm. people. Well, in a sense, we're doing it, and I just wanted to connect again with the resonance between Arpad and and yourself, Maggie, on that because what you're describing, the free university in the UK, is of course the conservation and the restoration of a tradition, of a tradition, of a set of ideas that are very old, very very important, that have only recently, let's say, become fully corrupted and um, mm. uh, are actively being, being reworked there. You know, the idea that a, a university is really an intellectual community, that it's, a, it's a, 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 a vocationally based and uh, electively um, uh, accomplished and so on, and it can't be anything other than that. And if it becomes taken out of that um, uh, tradition, uh, turned into a mere commodity and so on, then it, it, it loses something essential. And to restore it and to preserve it is entirely utopian and entirely democratic, as you, uh, as you, as you say also. Well, at least an entirely radical. It goes back to the root of it. 
you know, and the root of it is in um, a, a set of ideas, a set of uh, a, 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 and commitments, vocations, towards towards those ideas, and, so and on. in the history of the of the medieval university, you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of the Jameson's recent book, An American Utopia. I don't know how many people have had a chance to look at it. He he has an outrageous thought experiment uh, in there, and and he imagines how the U.S. military could be taken over as a source of dual power. Um, because the U.S. military can no longer, at least officially, discriminate on the basis of sex, gender, race, uh, 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 any identity provision. It has to educate you, it has to provide good health, it has to provide service in crises. And so, uh, you know, a mass movement into the military that then disarms it can create an available facility. Uh, now, this is in the great spirit of utopian imagination, but th there's something provocative there. One of the counter thoughts I had is, is to re-inhabit the church, to take over monasteries and, 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 and uh, convents and so forth, because, and this is what the utopian communal tradition has done for a long time. Intentional communal societies, intentional utopian communities like the eco-village, what do they do? And this is part of the preserve that, that mm. I can agree with, that the, uh, the sense of community, the sense of collective care, and the sense of witness and care for, for the external world. If we are in a, a, a change equivalent to that of the Middle Ages, I think we have to you know, maybe look to older models. Just, just as William Morris in News From Nowhere looked to the medieval uh, English town and look to the Icelandic structures. Yeah, so mm -hmm. we need artists and we need social activists. Yeah. Peter Bjorn, Federica. Um, my my question was uh, largely taken by Arthur. Um, I, I also like this this idea that we make the world a better place. And I was looking at the world behind you, which is a very good place. And yes. We have done a lot of the wrong things with the world, and I think it's very important to to have a sense of, of where we start from when we change our food, and and to have a notion of things to preserve. I, I actually think we need a kind of non-ideological conservatism. Like there are certain things that do not if it's been broken, we don't need to fix it. If our software program functions, we can have it for more than two months. Uh, uh, and this constant change, I think there, 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 that's important to keep in mind. There must be a balance of preserving and Here, and you, you, your, your comments also go in that direction. I, I think it's, it's good to remember that the word research yeah. means to search for something which is there, yeah. but it's a research reach out, got something that you know maybe yeah. we knew but but that went lost and I think that, that that's that's the spirit that, that we have to maintain. But since that is, since that question is has kind of like you, you answer to it and you now mentioned the monasteries and you mentioned the sixty eight moment in your own experience. Your talk today reminded me of a talk I saw the, the night before I left for Ireland, which was by uh, Pope Francis on on Teneretza. Uh, it was his TED talk he gave uh, on tenderness. Tenderness. And he basically uh, made all the same points that you are making today. Uh, how to use science for the good of, of human beings, care, uh, hope, yeah. uh, how to turn uh, you know, the care of the other uh, into something that can spread in, in loving circles. Uh, so I wanted maybe to, to ask that question to you. Um, how do you see now your uh, your relationship to what is coming from from the church, from Francis, the encyclical on the environment? Do you see is it just a distance, or are you also maybe seeing things that you can can and do connect to? Yeah, definitely. Let me get back to the first one, to the critical utopias of the 70s. I think we're we're. And in this sense, I would agree with both you and Arpad that, that in that dialectical sense of, of the change being a, an act of negation, preservation, and transformation, yeah, the, the problem with the older utopian habit was to simply wipe everything out and impose the new plan, and it's the danger of the plan. The critical utopias address this precise point that we need to debate 
uh, what to preserve and what not to preserve. In, in Kim Stanley Robinson's Mars Trilogy, as the humans are terraforming Mars and turning it into a better human place, there are a group of, of Mars supporters who want to preserve the ecosystem of Mars. Mm -hmm. And so it's a negotiated preservation struggle that goes on, and, and the Martians win a certain amount. Mm -hmm. um, Francis is an interesting figure. I, I'm so alienated from the church, and of course the Pope before him just drove me up a wall, because he was the authoritarian opposite who suppressed the liberation theologians. But Francis is very much in this spirit of, of carrying on you know, the old mole within the institution, and I think he's playing a long game of change uh, that is, I think, radically hopeful. Um, the other thing to add is, is my partner's a Buddhist, um, and we talk a lot about the politics of change and so forth, and, and uh, of course I cut my teeth on radical nonviolence, you know, and, and, and acting in terms of nonviolent civil disobedience. And the term she's introduced me to is, is that of radical compassion. That no matter how much and deeply we are involved in this kind of deep historic institutional systemic change, compassion has to be there. Mm. But you use that word more time. Sorry? You use that word more time. Did he? Yeah, well. Yeah. It's a little like martial arts. I'm not a martial arts person, but I like to talk about it the same way I like to talk <laughs> about snooker. Um, you know, martial arts takes the movement of the opponent and transforms it, as I understand it. Probably those of you who do it know better, but, but I think we, we have to be preservative, and I, I would agree with your small c conservatism. Yeah. Or maybe perhaps you're trying to conserve um, preserve, restore, and so on, uh, are those qualities that make us truly human, mm. not necessarily at the level of the rational, but at the level that you're suggesting, Francis suggests, which is tenderness, compassion, you know, these, uh, these soft uh, um, aspects, our vulnerabilities, let's say, and our, our ability to relate to one another, at that, and, th and that that's what's truly human, rather than, let's say, you know, the, 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 the dominance of reason and intellect. Something but he's like that. playing a very, very good political game at the same time. He's making reappointments in the Curia. He's gradually changing the, the, the balance, the political balance with the Cardinals. He, he can't make certain moves right now, but he's, he's making some deep changes in the structure, in the decision-making structure. Um, yeah, it's one of the best things. The, the, other, the other religious movement uh, that I keep in touch with is the Catholic Worker Movement in the U.S., uh, the sort of radical anarchists, the, uh, Catholics that come out of the work of Dorothy Day. But the American nuns, American religious orders of women are some of the most radically human and compassionate groups going right now. I mean, they, they are doing everything but being women priests. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're doing everything they can to nurture uh, the right of women to choose. They're getting involved in the peace movement to the extent that some of them sabotage trains and, and attack weapons, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, they're involved in campaigning against the death penalty. The Vatican mm -hmm. keeps trying to suppress them and they keep like mushrooms in the spring, they keep growing back up. They're, they're incredibly courageous people. Federica, I think your question. Uh, I wanted to link with the idea of changing. And actually, how, when we talk about changing, we talk about uh, transformation. So if you see that in a you know, rite of passage, you need a certain point to find a reconciliation with your presence. And you say, it's in, like utopia, the two main characteristics is it's impossible to exist in the present and the negation of the present. So in a kind of sense, when this future ends, so when this future perspective reaches an end, then you find again a reconciliation with the present. Because how you say, then on Mars you have a first revolution, <laughs> and then you have a second that go further, and then 
will be always something that can go further. So when you stop and you find yourself rejoin with the, pre with the present time, right? how can you rejoin present in this always futuristic perspective? I, the simple answer is never. Um, block. Bloch talks about the provinciality or, or, or the, the category of the provincial present that, that only considers the present in its own terms. But he says that, that any present moment at the level of, of ecology or sociology or, or social systems or behavior is full of possibilities and latencies and tendencies that can be pulled forward. People's ability to self-organize, people's ability to, to make their own cash, um, these are possibilities that are always there, and so there, there can be a move toward closer to the common good. Mm -hmm. But once it's, uh, and that's why I like to use the, the, the image of the utopian as horizon, because if you're off hill walking and you're walking toward the horizon, the horizon keeps shifting. The horizon is always there, and it keeps moving. So there will always be work to be done. Utopian achievements have a half-life. They will run down. There will be compromise. There will be corruption. There will be a stall. And so it has to be started over again. No, but no, what, I'm, what I was Sorry, maybe to, I'm No, no, like yeah, that's yeah. the point. I think that's yeah. exactly the point. So there's always an horizon, but what is the horizon? Yeah. What happens if a society just looks at the horizon and just keeps to don't look at what it's what's around. Yes. So if you're always <laughs> on this kind of perspective, then, yeah. you, then you lose what actually is we are. So we are not an utopian occupied space because we are here and we are now yeah. and we are in relationship with each other. So it's not something that yeah. that yeah. you can rejoin with present That's in this perspective. You lost to... Yeah. I, the, the you know, with walking, like yeah. if you're walking, you feel the, the ground or like on like under you. You don't always, you don't feel the ground that it's going to be. You feel what what you have around. And you trip. <laughs> you, know, you, you don't look at the. At you're the alive. You're, yeah. you're leaving. But this is the double movement. This is the double consciousness. That that sure that the the vision has to be the horizon, but there also has to be the step the first step and the second step. There's a lovely short story by, uh, by Subcomandante Marcos in his collection Zapatista stories, his old Antonio stories. And uh, the, the, the young Marcos is, is out with Antonio um, in the jungle and they get lost and they have to find their way home. And he said, how are we gonna do this? We don't have a map, we don't have a way, we don't have a machete. And he said, we walk. That the, the way is the getting there. It's, yeah. you know, there's not, mm. it, there has to be both. Yes. But the utopian power of Federica's question, if I understand you correctly, and I think it's a very beautiful question, is there's um, a utopia in the resting, in the settling, yeah. in the quietness of that in some way, because really the, the terrible dimension of the Faustian bargain is of course, you know, the price he pays, the price of his soul, is that he can never say, I'm good, you know, <laughs> this, this, this is good, let's live in the here and now, and so on. And that's, uh, that's really a, maybe a crucial question now, because in, in Faust's time, maybe it was worthwhile to sell his soul for infinite progress and always change and so on and so forth, but half of our problem now, or maybe the a great weight of our problem now is, acceleration to infinity we're we're at the abyss you know so that there's a great utopian power in actually saying you know hold on let's let's settle let's uh, mm -hmm. let's dwell in, in, in some way is that, that's yeah. yeah yeah no I'd I'd agree that's the beauty of uh, Morris's novel news from nowhere because it's a pastoral utopia it's 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 the slowness of the Middle Ages um, brought into the brought into the future you know because there is Dylan says there's no time to think you know we, we need to, and that's the slow movement of slow teaching or everything else we need to you know sometime may, maybe we just we need to down tools and stop yeah. Yeah. You know, smelling the roses is a utopian act yes <laughs> will we take one more question if there's if there's one from any quarter we decided to stop, just like you said so. You said, let's just down tools. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I should have. Thank you very much. 
Well, um, maybe this is a good time to... Sorry, Maggie. No, it's just kind of in response to Sloan, you know, the, um, having written on Sloan University. It, there's also the issue of, you know, who can afford to do Sloan. You know, with Sloan, you can only put Sloan in the kitchen. Um, yeah, so it comes back to, to class and politics. But, but this is the privilege uh, of the generational difference between, let's say, academics of our vintage who have positions, let's say, and the new precariat. And I'm really troubled by that myself, right? Because how do you speak now to a whole new generation of people who are really, really insecure in ways that the defining uh, privilege of the university life was the security that enabled you to stop and think and so on. And I, I'm really not sure that how to answer that. And I, I, I guess we should all maybe reflect on it. But maybe it's something like going back to Tom's point about the lives of the saints. Why is that such an important book? Because it's something about an exemplary life. You know, uh, so that then, you know, maybe maybe the appropriate thing to do for those of us who can afford to do it, as it were, is to actually somehow demonstrate in an exemplary way that it's OK to actually slow the thing down, to refuse to be accelerated into the infinite uh, series of demands we get from our institutions and so on and so forth, and to actually live as you've founded it, <laughs> Maggie, the slow university, and sort of insist on that and say, well, actually, no, this is what the university, th this is what the university is. Which is you don't need to buy a map or a machete to go to You don't need to go further. It's not, it's not that you have to afford it. Alternatively, following Rowena, is you could mentor a, a, a new worker and give them some of your salary. Redistribution. <laughs> you know, make it a little bit more real for you. Well, that, if, if, so, sort of take Sinn Fein's uh, payment schedule. You know, just accept the industrial wage and yeah. redistribute the rest. But sometimes I think it's, it's when we talk that. about it, it seems easier, but when you have to actually do it, I know, I know. It's yeah. nice, it, that's a lot more difficult. You remember that that was the first thing that our present president, Michael D. Higgins, did on being appointed to the office. He took the salary, yeah. he cut it by 25%, and he says, actually, this is what I'm being paid. I'm giving this back to the exchequer. You know, which is very interesting. Trump did the same thing. Oh wow! Well, you see, there, there, there's a there's a good a, a good example being followed even by a bad. <laughs> well, yes. I mean, I think that's a very interesting practical uh, suggestion. I think that the sincere way of supporting the young generation is through providing such kind of spa safe spaces as the summer school, mm -hmm. or some some places that are somewhat excluded from the. And to be available to give feedback, to help and to and work. I, I mean, the international correspondence I get, and just I emails. Ethics in teaching in more for the workers or teachers that have more stable positions is very important because it stabilizes the teaching market. Mm. Yeah. The, the teaching side of the academia. Mm. So that, that's the thing that I, I mean personally expect from the older generation. Not to lecture me, mm -hmm. provide some safe spaces, looking like an academia. Can you be a bit louder, please? Yeah. First of all, provide safe spaces. Second of all, do not lecture me, do not impose any ethical or you know, leave me some place to have my own reflection uh, without your own historical experience of yeah. your previous area. Yeah. And the third thing, provide some stable teaching uh, by themselves, stabilizing the teaching side of academia. Yeah. Like this yeah. mm -hmm. That's the best thing I expect from a yeah. more stable yeah. academic side. By, by which you mean, if I could just draw that out, um, the tendency of the university now is to drive people towards the pursuit of research monies and so on and so forth. So the, the, the highest mark of one's achievement in university life at the moment is to not teach, to actually buy yourself out and to take off and so on and so forth. And, and that's really, as you say, quite um, problematic in, in, in 
ways. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but, but I believe that uh, opposition tactics de depends on what stage of career are you at. Yes, 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 yes. And obviously for some younger people we need to play the, grand, the game of grants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we could try to take it. Yeah. We could try to hop into those grants and skew mm. it. Mm. To write at them and use them to, to, to you know, we cannot give it, you cannot, mm. at our generation, we cannot resign from using this. You know, I know, yeah. I know, I yeah. know. Yeah. Well, I think perhaps on that uh, on that note, which is a conversation we can pick up over dinner and so on and so forth, let's draw our conversation just this afternoon now to an end. And I'd like you all to thank uh, Tom and to thank Rowena for an earlier conversation. Thank you. You're very welcome.